Howdy folks, Jambariki here, and welcome to another video in which I rank a bunch of animated villains. In this video, I'm going to be finally tackling the Studio Ghibli rogues gallery. Now, a lot of Ghibli villains fall into this grey area for the definition of villain, and you could pretty much class a lot of them as anti-villains. So, if I may, I'd like to have a little leeway when it comes to the criteria for which characters count as villains for this video. If I was too pedantic about the requirements, then I would have ended up with a video in which I only rank about two or three characters and that would have made for a disappointingly short video for you all. With all that said, let the countdown begin. Bella Yaga from Earwig and the Witch. Bella Yaga is a witch who adopts a spoiled little girl called Erica and makes a new daughter work as her assistant. I've seen Bella Yaga being categorised as a designated villain because she's not really a danger to the public, but let's not ignore the facts. She's overworking a child for slave labour, physically and verbally bullies said child, and frequently threatens other characters with an infection spell. Or while deceptively putting on a fake nice lady act to her customers? Yes, Erica is a brat who needs to be taught many lessons, but nothing excuses child abuse. So yeah, I'd say Bella is still a flavour of evil. Is she a good villain though? Well, unfortunately, she's the antagonist for the worst Ghibli movie I've ever seen, and she ends up falling prey to the movie's many, many problems. For starters, she's boringly repetitive. All she ever does is angrily snap orders at Erica, and it could become grating watching her mainly just going, Get this plant from the garden! Or mix this ingredient up! She's a very mundane antagonist with little to offer. There aren't enough nettles in here. Go pick some more! What? Again? Sure, she can lose her temper, but a one and only threat is giving worms? I got so sick of her saying, Worms, 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 worms! It's not the only spell you've got! <laughs> She's a little scary, I guess, but Erica often easily outwits or humiliates her, and Bella's roommate, the Mandrake, happens to be far, far, far more menacing than the witch. Ibig and the Witch also suffers from terrible CGI an animation medium that is not in Ghibli's wheelhouse. The plastic soullessness of the Uncanny Valley 3D character animation means that Bella ends up with a disappointingly limited acting range, and a grotesque design that's an ugly eyesore to look at. Foster mother indeed! Ha! Now go and put more fuel under the cauldron! The film tries to give her a meaningful backstory, but that's not really explored until the very last 5 or 10 minutes of the movie, because oh boy does Earwig have awful storytelling pacing, making for a very rushed attempt at giving Bella any kind of rounded dimension, as she quickly and suddenly shows a different side to herself just before the credits roll. I'm here to say, you come bother me out, cause you wear. Bella Yaga could have been an iconic Ghibli witch, but she's sadly starring in the studio's biggest clunker as of today. She fails as a villain and as a character in general. Wonderland President from Pompoko. When the Tanuki of Tama Hills put on a huge parade to scare humans away from their home, the president of a theme park called Wonderland takes all the credit for their work. On the one hand, this villain is just your generic corrupt businessman, the trope that most Save the Forest movies go for when creating antagonists. So, he doesn't exactly stand out in Ghibli's gallery of colourful rogues. However, he's still an important cog in the machine, serving as a face for Wonderland who throws a sharp pebble into the Tanuki's quest. Oh, and audiences will rightfully enjoy hating him, because we've spent ages watching the Tanuki training very, very hard as Transformers and pushing themselves to their extreme for the parade. Then in comes this sweaty creep to rob their recent win, thus derailing any progress for the Tanuki's mission to save their home. Heck, you could argue that he's shooting himself in the foot, because now he has to find who actually made the parade. Imagine being so money-hungry and lazy that you end up taking credit for nature's imagination. This is why it's so satisfying to see him get his comeuppance near the end. At the very hands of the Tanuki themselves, mind you. He really had it coming. So yeah, this villain stood very little chance of ranking high, but I would not say that he's a bad villain. A little dumb and impulsive, but come on, those seem to be the typical traits of your run-of-the-mill wealthy CEO nowadays. He's just a very ordinary antagonist competing against extraordinary anime icons. 
Georgina from when Marnie was there. Georgina is the strict nanny of a little girl called Marnie. Now, you could argue that she's just doing her job, and maybe you'll even feel sorry for her as the care of a child with neglection issues. <laughs> However, Marnie feels that her nan bullies her, from painfully yanking on Marnie's arm to drag her places, to brushing her hair way too hard. It's almost like a nanny enjoys overpowering a boss's daughter while her parents are frequently absent. Georgina always has this angry scowl on her face too, which makes her pretty scary for a supposed child carer. Oh, and she casually lets her maid assistants taunt the poor child as well, who even threatened to abandon her in a silo during a heavy storm. Anna, I think I can endure anything else. Anything but the silo. At the end of the day, Nan goes to show that villains can sometimes be domestic abusers to go unnoticed. Sure, Georgina might not be on the same level as Lady Tremaine or Mother Gothel, but she's still a dark chapter in the tragic life of Marnie, who suffer from trauma after trauma in a lonely existence. Haru from Arietti. Haru is a housekeeper who suspects that a family of borrowers are living under the house. So, she tries to capture them all before little boy Sho can save them from her. Haru seems like a humble maid to her boss, but once she becomes obsessed with collecting the borrowers, she starts using her sweet housekeeper persona as a cover for a devious plan. Though, it is hard for her to look friendly when her smile is honestly terrifying. You could suggest that she's getting a thrill from hunting tiny people, because she spent all of her life under the thumb of someone else, and this is her chance for a power trip. And you're not the only one here, I bet. I think Haru's biggest strength is her detective skills. She's very good at catching on to show secretiveness surrounding the borrowers, and has an eye for tiny clues to their presence in the house. At the same time, too, she knows her limits as an old lady, hence why she resorts to asking for help from pest control. We've something small in the house, but not nice. Not nice? I don't want them killed. So much of the film's third act's tension stems from Haru and Sho trying to outwit each other as they both pretend to not know about the borrowers, all while they attempt to make their next move. It's a thrilling hero-villain dynamic for a domestic setting. <gasps> but I'd knocked them. I'd knocked? While Sho is trying his best to help Ariati's family, and sees the borrowers as real living creatures with rights and feelings, Haru demonizes them all as thieving pests, traumatizes them, and treats them like collection trophies. However, I will admit that Haru's end goal seems to be a bit too vague. Yeah, she's going to show her borrower collection to a boss, but then what? I don't think even Haru herself knows. Although, it's kind of funny seeing a child with a struggling heart condition expertly outwit her by the end. You know she wasn't playing her A game when a poorly little boy managed to smart her. I had it right in here. It's not my imagination. There are little people. I'll get one, that I swear. Oh. Lord Cobb from Tales from Earthsea. Lord Cobb is an evil wizard who greatly fears death. So much so, that he's dedicated his entire life to finding immortality, while monstrously running a human slave market to make money. Cobb is unfortunately the antagonist of a very boring Ghibli movie, so he doesn't really get to do much for a lot of the movie, besides play the waiting game, monologue about death, or dump backstory exposition for the audience. However, he's maybe the most fun part of an otherwise solemn movie. While he's yet to find eternal life, his years of dark magic research has given him exceptional advantages and powers that most mortals don't possess. I have studied the wisdom of the ages. I will power. I am almighty. He's also so petty about Sparrowhawk the Archmage, the wizard who banished him, that he's just as passionate about revenge. From kidnapping Sparrowhawk's love for bait, to manipulatively turning the Archmage's own apprentice against him, by selfishly infecting him with his same brand of death anxiety, making for a really personal one-on-one -on -one confrontation between two wizards with history. Lebanon, this man would deprive you of eternal life. Which all leads to a showdown that's completely in Cobb's favour, because Cobb's castle weakens other magic users like Sparrowhawk, and Cobb has the power to move the stones of his own home. Huh. 
Heck, it's the film's finale that totally breaks Cobb. You see, once he loses some of his dark magic, he becomes a decrepit, desperate old man who is just as vulnerable as everyone else and has to face the harsh truth about death. Life can't be hoarded. It can only be given. Deny death, and you deny life. Yeah. Wrong. I think what's truly despicable about him is that despite his pity party over his thanatophobia, he's completely willing to threaten others with death and actually enjoys murdering those who get in his way. She's dead. She's dead. Poor thing. If he wasn't so selfish, I would actually sympathise with him, because I too have suffered from death anxiety before, and can see some of my own worst fears in his terrified face. But alas, he is just an evil wizard out for himself. The Cat King from The Cat Returns When teenager Haru saves the Cat Prince, the Cat King vows to thank her by arranging a marriage between Haru and the Prince, despite Haru's protests. Luckily, the heroic Cat Baron has volunteered to save her. The Cat King is an over-pampered monarch with crazy eyes and possible dementia. It's his unhealthy possessiveness of Haru that makes him relentlessly obsessed with assuring that she never escapes. There's a creepy predatory nature to his relationship with Haru that's kind of uncomfortable to watch. So look, I have a great idea. You should marry me instead. <gasps> Despite being a deranged feline who lets his luxury life go to his head, the Kang King can be a keen strategist. From sending his soldiers to monitor any cheating in the maze out of his kingdom, to sneakily setting up fake walls in said maze to mess with our heroes' heads. Wait a minute, I know there wasn't a wall here. Your brain's overheating. No, it's not. We just walked through here, Muda. What do you think? Did walls have legs? The Cat Returns might be one of Ghibli's more cutesy movies, but it does richly explore the theme of unconditional kindness. While Haru performs acts of compassion with no rewards in mind, and the Cat Baron offers his services for free in the name of justice, the Cat King excessively love bombs Haru without ever listening to what she wants. Heck, all of his so-called gifts are geared more towards cats, Once Haru's rejection finally gets through to the Gang King, he suddenly abandons all of his formal regality and becomes a sword-swinging psychopath who goes in a rampage. He may be a pampered kitty, but he is not lazy. Once he's run out of his chess pieces, he will enter the field. <laughs> What's interesting too, is that after all the embarrassing humiliation he's faced, he is humble enough to finally admit that he's not fit to be king anymore. It's obvious that he's just too senile for the job, and his son is better suited for the throne. I've been thinking, it may be time for me to retire. I think I shall accompany you, sire. I find it endearingly funny that Ghibli decided to end our villain's arc with, eh, just send him to a care home. <laughs> It's debatable if he deserves a comfortable retirement, but it's an ending that I guess fits a light-hearted silly movie like The Cat Returns. The Mama Ayuto Gang from Porco Rosso. This gang of goofy amateur pirates are a recurring foe for our hero Porco, and I love them so, so, so much. They're one of my favourite go-to examples for animated comedic villains done really well. They try to seem menacing and experienced, but they're just a bunch of idiots playing pirates. Gotcha! It's so endearing how they're basically the underdogs of the pirate community, often seen as the butt of the joke to other seaplane pilots. A part of me actually feels sorry for them because of this. Look at that! Those Mama Ayuno guys can't even afford paint! It's embarrassing to be seen with them! Their leader is so passionate about being the best pirates they can be, yet his crew never live up to the image he desperately wants. This is where so much of the comedy gold comes from. It's just really funny how their personalities contradict the reputation they're seeking. Like when the gang kidnaps some little girls, they end up playing babysitter and forget that they're supposed to be scary. Are you seaplane pirates? That's right. So we're your hostages? That's right too. Smells like you never bathed. You're shocked. How cute. Could use some blood. They have a really personal vendetta against Porco too. Mr. Rosso always easily outwits these morons on every heist. 
So the gang have developed a grudge against the Crimson Pig, though Porco doesn't fear or hate them enough to return the rivalry. He says, hand over the girls in the gold and I'll let you keep some loot so you can repair your ship. I'd hate to put you jerks out of business. We get to keep That's some. That's generous. We're not giving in, you idiot. It's actually Porco's engineer, Theo, who puts them in line like they're naughty children, going to show that all these guys really needed was some strict discipline to help them grow up. You can't gang up on a fellow seaplane pilot? Where's your honor? The film even sweetly ends with the gang's leader sincerely praising Theo and wishing her the best. You're a great seaplane engineer. Keep it up, Miss Theo. Then we cut years later to them getting old and settling down. It's such a charming bookend to their arcs. The Mama Ayuto gang often steal the show in this film, and I think it's all because they fit so perfectly into the film's humour. Though you could also criticise them for creepily fawning over a 17-year-old girl in this film. <laughs> Donald Curtis from Porco Rosso. Donald Curtis is a famous American seaplane pilot who teams up with a gang of pirates to take down the famous bounty hunter Porco Rosso. Donald is such a freaking great comedic villain a brilliantly tongue-in-cheek parody of American 1930s male celebrities who works really well as a spoof of Hollywood toxic masculinity, a total twit with his head so far up his own arse that even Narcissus himself would tell him to chill out. Alas, a solitary rose blooms in a secret garden. That's my favourite line from a screenplay I wrote. He's a womanising, egocentric idiot who mistakes lust for love, and the way he treats women is very gross. He sees them all as trophies he can wear as arm candy when he goes home. Oh, and dang can he be creepy. Not only does he break into Gina's home to propose to her for a second time, but he also perversely goes after Porco's underage engineer like a dirty old man. Beautiful. Tell you what, if I win, will you marry me, darling? It's his repulsive arrogance, entitlement, and vanity that makes him so entertaining to hate. Whenever he's on screen, you'll want to throw things at him. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you think you can hit me from there? Come on, give me a break. He's a great rival to Porco, too. At first, Porco just ignores Donald, seeing him as a typical Yank pilot. But as the film goes on, Donny Boy makes things more and more personal, almost like he's trying to steal Porco's life. Oh, come on, baby. I hit the pit. You didn't hit anything. My engine died, you idiot. The tension brews and bubbles throughout the movie until everything culminates in a one-on-one -on -one betting contest that pits hero against villain. It's like we've been waiting for this showdown and dang does it pay off. Donald might be a dunderhead, but he makes for a worthy opponent for Porco in both aerial dogfighting and amateur boxing. It's a gripping climax that all works because the hero-villain dynamic has been so well developed. I especially love the boxing fight because it forces the two to finally open up to each other face to face and Porco's repressed feelings come out at long last. Gina does not want me, you liar! I'm not lying. Why would I make that up? So you want Gina? Oh, and even after Donald loses, he actually handles his loss with grace. Now that his ego has finally been beaten down, oh, and he actually agrees to help Porco take on some invading fascists. So maybe, just maybe, he has some potential to be a hero? Donald Curtis is both a fun-to-hate idiot and an entertaining nemesis for the flight-savvy Crimson Pig. This is exactly how you write a good villain for an action cartoon comedy. Jigo from Princess Mononoke. At first, Jigo seems like a humble monk just looking out for our hero Ashitaka. But down the road, we learn that he's actually a crooked man who is making Lady Eboshi of Iron Town help him steal the head of a forest god so that the Emperor can reap it for immortality. Now, yes, Jigo is a monk, but even those in religious or spiritual roles can actually have a shady side. This monk has made high connections and isn't afraid to wormily guilt those in power. Listen, you owe me and I've come to collect. When you needed riflemen, I sent them. And without those riflemen, you lose Iron Town. It's extra shifty how Jigo is actually using Lady Eboshi as a pawn. He's reluctant to kill a god with his very own hands, because that could bite him later. So he relies on Eboshi to sneakily avoid any responsibility for a god's death, which is true to his weasley nature and admittedly a clever tactic. Why do we need that woman, sir? When you're going to kill a god, let someone else do your dirty work. His team of hunters are equally strategic, especially when they creepily use the dead carcasses of boar gods as freaky disguises. As dodgy as these guys are, you've got to hand it to their craftiness. No, Florida Koto, your warriors have to come back to you.
we do actually get to know Jigo before we learn of his shadier side. You see, it's revealed that he's a very pessimistic man, who has let the sinking horrors of the world turn him apathetic. He's clearly lost any sense of morality. These days, there are angry ghosts all around us, dead from wars, sickness, starvation, and nobody cares. So you say you're under a curse? Well, so what? So's the whole damn world. Hence why he's so casual about doing arguably bad things. Now, yes, Jigo is a short, stout man who doesn't seem built for combat. But once Ashitaka crosses his path, we realize that he does actually have very impressive martial arts skills. Oh dear, you make it sound so very easy. You really ought to- Relax! Oh. <laughs> 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 Get going! Jigo is quite possibly the closest we get to a traditionally evil character in Princess Mononoke, but even then, you could easily read him as a disillusioned monk who has lost faith in the world and has just adapted to living in an unforgiving chaos that surrounds him. Oh, and let's not forget that the Emperor is breathing down his neck. Ryutaro from Pompoko. Ryutaro is a transforming fox who disguises himself as a human to collaborate with the president of Wonderland and offers a chance for amusement park work to the Tanuki of Tama Hills. There's something skin crawling about how sly this fox really is. He's decided to sell out as a wild magical animal and join forces with the very kind of corporation that's building over his species homes. He doesn't even seem that reluctant or guilty about his self-betrayal because he's clearly having a bit too much fun after becoming a wealthy businessman. Using his natural cunningness to prey on the desperate Tanaki and intrigue the theme park president into exploiting said Tanaki. I am the only one who can possibly lead you to the ones responsible for that spectacular parade, but I require my fair share of the business. However, he's still a Ghibli villain, so the film doesn't boringly paint him as a one-dimensional straw man. He's allowed to argue some valid points. The human world requires wealth and greed, so how will you make the money you need? You use the skills you have and you will succeed. And where do you think you can earn the most money for your skills? I'm afraid that would be your great enemy. And even gets to counter-argue any concerns thrown at him. But what happens to the raccoons who can't transform? Those who can't transform will have to fend for themselves. Mm. It's sad, but only the fittest can survive in order for the species to continue. Plus, Ryotaro's offer is a very tempting easy out. And I wouldn't blame the Tanaki for taking it after the fruitlessness of their mission has exhausted them. Ultimately though, the Tanaki declined the chance to be theme park Imagineers and managed to double cross an actual fox by the end. Which is quite the flex. Oh, and can I just say how much I love Ryotaro's human design? It screams devious and mischievous. It's the perfect design for a character this shrewd. Madam Suleiman from Howl's Moving Castle. Suleiman is a royal sorceress who is determined to drain the magic powers of the anti-war hero Howl. You could defend Suleiman as an authority figure who is just trying to police magic users that could be a danger. But she does say that she'll only let the magic users keep their magic if they work for the army. So she totally has a military driven bias. Oh, and Suleiman herself is an advanced OP sorceress in a position of nationalist power, mind you. So who is she to decide who gets to keep their magic? I mean, her method of magic stripping is kind of sneaky and devious. She forces her victims to sweat themselves on the palace stairs so that they will immediately fall for her bait chair. And then she traps them with her traumatic dark art spell. There's an arrogance to a sorceress who uses such magic without any remorse. But that's the appeal of her as a villain, I think. Her unshakable smooth confidence. She's in a constant state of calmness because she's so skilled and smart. From seeing through Hal's disguise to catching on that Hal's cursed housemaid Sophie is actually in love with Hal. Now I understand you're in love with Hal. <gasps> Oh. While she does spend the whole film in her sanctuary, she's still a masterful commander of the army and has a lot of fun with a cat and mouse game against Hal. That was the most fun I've had in ages. I suppose Hal thinks he's evaded me. <laughs> I bet his mother can help me find him. All while she relishes in the power she gains from the war she's fueling. Oh, and she has some pretty interesting minions too. Like a charming pet dog who acts as a spy, but just ends up joining Hal's party instead. <laughs> Don't try to be cute, dog. I'm still not going to trust you. As well as some creepy child clones that do her every bidding. I would have liked a serious comeuppance for her war crimes in the end, but at least she admits that said war is dumb and plans to help end it. The game is over. Get me the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense. It's time to put an end to this idiotic war. Yes, Kushina from Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. 
Kushner is a princess who is determined to destroy a toxic jungle that homes insects called Ohm. But our heroine, Nausicaa, wants to defend said Ohm. You see, Kushner lost one of her arms to an Ohm as a child, and the amputation traumatized her so much that she now deeply resents Ohm, even though Ohm are actually peaceful, loving creatures at heart. You're so kind. It's gonna be all right. Soon they'll be here to take you home. It's her personal tragedy that dictates Kushner's actions, which can often lead to casualties or hostages. She goes as far as to create a legendary giant warrior to take the Ohm down, but her frightened impatience results in a half-baked monster. Incinerate them! What are you waiting for? Were you not designed to be the most evil creature on the face of the earth? The trauma even shows in a brass armor which is heavy, bulky, and bigger than a natural size, which visually represents a desperate need to guard herself from danger, being terrified of both losing her inherited position of power in a male-dominated kingdom, and re-experiencing another violent wildlife attack. Kushner can be seen as the darkness to Nausicaa's light. Like Nausicaa, Kushner is a brave, determined princess who wants to lead her people, except Kushner is driven by war and fear while Nausicaa vouches for pacifism and love. Both are strong monarchs who are aiming for different ideas of victory. The insects must be stopped. You must revive the warrior and use it to destroy them and their jungle. Steal it from us as we stole it from Pegite. However, Nausicaa is willing to change Kushner's mind. There's a chance that Kushner and Nausicaa could become one in the same, but it all requires Kushner to let her guard down first and observe the real beauty of the Ohm. That's what makes her such a compelling character. We get to see the journey of a trauma victim, learning to understand the very thing that traumatized her. She really is a fine example of Ghibli's ability to use villains to deep dive into the human psyche. Don't move! I'm the one who gives the orders! What are you so afraid of? You act like a scared little fox squirrel. What did you call me? Don't be afraid. The Witch of the Waste from Howl's Moving Castle. When timid hatshop owner Sophie ends up being rescued by the famous dashing Howl the Wizard, the jealous Witch of the Waste curses Sophie with an old lady transformation spell. The Witch of the Waste is first introduced as a classy, beautiful lady with a cruel tongue. What a tacky shop. I've never seen such tacky little hats. Yet you're by far the tackiest thing here. However, when the witch is invited to the royal palace by Madame Solomon, all that cocky arrogance is toppled down. She's humiliated into walking the tall stair entrance, which is such a delicious, mm, tasty karma for a Sophie rooting audience. Because we get to point and snicker at her, she whines and sweats away. <laughs> Just shut up. And then has her magic drained by Solomon. Surprisingly though, it's a transformation that shows the real Witch of the Waste. A different side to her that makes a second guess her villainy. As Solomon explains that she was once a good witch who made a pact with a demon that ruined her life. Without her magic, she's just this withering, senile old lady consumed by a drug-like craving for men's hearts. Suddenly, despite what she did to Sophie, we actually find ourselves pitying her? She's now lost all of her fret, and has become sort of the endearing, quirky great-grandma of Howell's family. Don't feed her, that's the Witch of the Waste! Oh, she's alright. She keeps staring at me, it's freaking me out. What a pretty fire. Saying that though, she doesn't simply magically change back into her old self, just because she can't throw spells and curses around anymore. Sure, her dignity is being stripped, but she's still unhealthily obsessed with men's hearts, and she can't simply let go of this addiction. Strapping young men are so difficult to deal with, but their hearts I just adore. You're terrible. While she can be a helpful member of the family sometimes, she can also get in the way. And a strange craving for Howl's heart becomes one of the biggest obstacles for our heroes, as well as a test for the Witch of the Waste development. Can she overcome her addiction and do the right thing? Is the witch she once was still inside her deep down? <laughs> Howl needs that back now. Don't look at me. I don't have it. I don't know what you're talking about. Please. Please give it back. 
The Witch of the Waste is one of my favourite examples of a villain redemption arc. It's a very natural growth back to her old self that requires her to overcome the darkness that plagues her. Plus, she's also just a really fun character, whether she's playing the jealous diva or the eccentric granny. This is exciting. Mama Dola from Laputa Castle in the Sky. Dola is a pirate captain who is after a Laputa stone belonging to Princess Sheeta, with help from her loyal but bumbling sons. Based on director Hayao Miyazaki's own mother, Dola is a fiery and boisterous woman who loves being a pirate captain. She's not into pirating for superficial reasons though. She often demonstrates a wide variety of skills, from tactical leadership to expert flight navigation. Well, it looks like we're cruising on the windward side of him. So if we manage to ride the trade wind, Let's see, according to my calculations, uh, with wind velocity of 10... As loud and grouchy as she is, she's quite an intelligent and observant woman. She catches on to small things that most villains would simply ignore or miss. You chowder heads! Get your brother and hop on! Uh huh? But she just hiding inside that house! Hey, lame brain, they made an escape! However, I could argue that she's not a conventionally evil villain, but rather a neutral-sided criminal who is out for herself. Our heroes just happen to be caught between Dola's crew and their next treasure hunt. So when Sheeta and her friend Partsu join Dola, Ship, we get to see a different side to Dola. She tries to put on a tough front to scare people, but she's actually got grandmotherly qualities and sees her younger self in Sheeta. I must admit, those kids are cute. What do you mean by that, you old fool? Nothing but that little girl does remind me of you not so long ago. Who asked ya? We also begin to respect how courageous and determined Dola is as a pilot. Like, even when a military airship attacks her crew during a freaking hurricane, she's still adamant to keep sailing on refusing to back down to two obstacles at once. Dola is a fantastic legendary character who defies all stereotypes against old ladies, proving that even elderly women can be badass pirates, while also still being grandmother figures to the next generation. Oh, poor little thing. Nothing worse than having your pigtail shot off. What have you got under there? Oh, my fault. You must have hurt yourself on these. No Face from Spirited Away No Face is a mysterious spirit that hangs outside the bathhouse. When human girl Chihiro invites No Face into the bathhouse though, he becomes a greedy monster who eats up all the workers. I adore No Face. He's one of my top favourite Ghibli characters. He could be ominously creepy as a wandering spirit, and downright frightening as a goblin mutation. You could maybe argue that he's perhaps the scariest Ghibli villain we've ever had. I mean, the scene where he chases after Chihiro will make you feel your heart in your throat. Despite being a major threat in Spirited Away though, I personally find him to be a remarkably relatable character. He's a lonely spirit who longs for friends, but he doesn't have the social skills or natural approachability to make pals. He tries to eat his pain away with a giant buffet, but that just bloats his body. He fakes gold to gain popular adoration, but none of this love is real. True to the film's theme of greed, his overconsumption does nothing to better his life, and he becomes this pathetic mess who lives in his own filth. We've all been there at one stage. We can see ourselves at our lowest points in this sad, lonely creature who has developed unhealthy habits. He may be a spirit, but dang does he come off human. Don't you have any friends or family? No. No. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. It's only when No Face finally leaves the bathhouse, a cesspool that symbolizes his luxury greed, that he at long last frees himself from his sick gluttony, and then learns social cues from Chihiro. Uh, uh, sit here. Behave yourself, okay? Said development helps him to not only find a family with Yubaba's sister Zaniba, but also a purpose in his life. No face, why don't you stay with me? I could use a good helper. Uh, uh. No face is you and me, he is everyone. We can all let our fears or loneliness turn us into monsters, especially in toxic environments. But if given the chance, we can also improve ourselves and earn real unconditional love. Colonel Muska from Laputa Castle in the Sky. Muska is a government agent assigned to locate the mysterious sky island of Laputa, but he's actually a Laputa descendant who wants to use his ancestors' technology for evil. Muska has an undeniable swagger to him. 
He's a smooth talking secret agent who knows what he wants and how he can get it quickly. He even has the official military at his whim and he holds his power over them with a smarmy pride. Muska, just don't forget that the government put me in charge of finding Lapuna. Don't forget that as the government's secret agent, I am in charge of you, General. He has this creepy knack for taking advantage of others' weaknesses, too, so that he will always get his way. Like, when Muska interrogates Sheeta, she doesn't give him the information he wants, but he knows that he can't do anything to her because she's the only one who can trigger the stone's magic. So, he deviously creates the narrative that the military are threatening to kill Partu unless she complies. While acting as this sympathetic middleman, even though he's the one that has the power of the military? Please let me see Patsu. I don't want to see any harm come to anyone, but I simply can't control what the military might do to him. What? He's a natural at pretending to be a hero who is concerned about public safety, but he clearly has a dark fascination with the power of Laputa technology, and we get the impression that he knows more than he puts on. So, when it turns out that Muska has actually been meticulously researching his ancestors' culture for years, and is really a Laputa descendant who has gone mad with power, we don't raise any questions at all. My real name is Romska Pala Ul Laputa. <gasps> Muska doesn't respect his ancestor's beautiful nature. He's only greedily obsessed with the power that the island has as an apocalyptic superweapon. It's all shallow interest. Heck, he's actually genuinely angry and upset that plant life has overgrown the once abandoned Laputa. He's offended at nature being nature. He's that superficial. What's happened here? Ugh, these filthy roots don't belong in this chamber. Muska's undoing is letting Laputa's princess, Sheeta, share his throne. Muska isn't the rightful king of Laputa, he's just a pompous megalomaniac with a superiority complex who sees himself as a god above humanity. Sheeta is a true princess, kind, caring and brave. You see, a king without compassion does not deserve a kingdom. Hence why it's so powerful when Sheeta and Patsu, who are far more righteous than Muska, bravely sacrifice themselves and the island, leaving Muska to die along with his crumbling kingdom. Now that is how you end a fascist villain's arc. Lady Eboshi from Princess Mononoke. Eboshi is the leader of Iron Town, an industrial village that resources iron from the local forest. While Iron Town flourishes thanks to Eboshi's leadership, it comes at the cost of damaging the environment and angering the forest gods. Eboshi walks this fascinatingly thin line between hero and villain that makes her deeply complex. Let me explain. She's a sympathetic woman who has given safer lives to brothel women and secure jobs to those with leprosy. Her distinct kindness makes her people incredibly loyal to her and grateful for her love. She's the only one who saw us as human beings. We are lepers the world hates and fears us, but she, she took us in and washed our rotting flesh and bandaged us. She's also a very gifted riflewoman and sword fighter, skills that help her to defend her people. Yeah, these are violent talents, but she still commands herself with elegance, calmness, and integrity as a leader. She might be a badass, but she's still in a position of grace and honor. At the same time though, she remains a dangerous threat to the forest and a source of suffering for the wildlife that live there. You would do that, kill the very heart of the forest? Without that ancient god, the animals here would be nothing but dumb beasts once more. When the forest has been cleared and the wolves wiped out, this desolate place will be the richest land in the world. Of course, the animals cause just as many victims as she does, but she's the one who started this war. However, the film is fair and unbiased enough to know that she can't simply stop attacking the forest, because without its iron, she can't keep supporting her people with jobs, homes, and safety. Like I said, she's a very complicated character. We find ourselves both idolizing her and resenting her. She also made the mistake of working with the shady monk Jigo, something she pays for later when Jigo asks for her help in taking the head of the spirit of the forest, meaning that she plays a major part in a god's vengeance upon the land, which in turn endangers her own people. Thankfully, said ordeal humbles the lady, and she agrees to start fresh as Iron Town's leader, perhaps with more environmentally friendly ideas in mind from now on. Amazing. The wolves and that crazy little wolf girl helped save us all. Ashitaka. Can someone find him? I need to thank him. We're going to start all over again. This time we'll build a better town. Lady Eboshi shows that animated villains can be incredibly layered. She's more of a very flawed human than a one-dimensional cartoon baddie. I see her as a perfect guide on how to write good villains for environmental fables without being too preachy. 
Yubaba from Spirited Away. When young Chihiro's parents are turned into pigs, she volunteers to work for Yubaba the Witch, boss of a bathhouse for spirits and the sorceress who transformed Chihiro's parents into pigs. Yubaba is a very successful and professional businesswoman with a knack for good customer service for spirits of all walks of life. But it's undoubtedly cruel how Yubaba's punishment of Chihiro's parents has left the poor child all alone to fend for herself. All while she feels no sympathy at all for the little girl, this bitter witch has ruined this child's life and it's genuinely heartbreaking. <laughs> Yubaba is also a fiercely grouchy woman with a wild temper that she uses to strike fear into people. The terrible anger is what makes her so memorable as a villain. I can even imagine her giving nightmares to more sensitive audiences. Please, I just want to work! Don't say that! Oh, and she's also a huge hypocrite. She lectures Chihiro about being a spoiled brat, yet over pampers her own son like he's a royal prince. Plus, she scolds Chihiro's parents for being greedy when she's a gold-obsessed witch who underpays her staff. Like I said, Spirited Away is mainly about greed, and Yubaba represents the greed for power. She's let her magic abilities go to her head, and profit has become a priority. Or while her employees sleep together in the same room and feel that they can't afford to go live their dreams. I've got to get out of this place. Someday I'm getting on that train. But a big part of Yubaba's character is that she steals the identities of whoever she wants. Not only has she stolen Chihiro's name and renamed her Sen, but she's also made Haku, her apprentice, forget who he is, so that she can have complete control over him as his superior, going to show how important our identities are to our free will and self-confidence. Without them, we can be victims to those who want to take advantage. From now on, your name is Sen. You got that? Answer me, Sen. Yes, ma'am. What's really fascinating, though, is that we end up meeting Yubaba's twin sister, Zaniba, a character who is supposed to be the polar opposite of Yubaba, a grandmotherly and humble witch who lives in peace in a cottage, hinting that maybe it's capitalist excess that has made Yubaba who she is. Or maybe Yubaba is the kind of villain that No Face could have turned into if he never left the bathhouse. Yubaba isn't just one of the most iconic Ghibli villains ever, she's also one of the most popular and memorable animated villains of cinema history. So that was my official ranking. Who is your favourite Studio Ghibli villain and why? Let everyone know in the comment section below. I've been Jam Feel free to subscribe and cheerio folks! Yeah.